I promised Chris that I would put the, uh, the prime material for heckling me at the very beginning of the talk so you know like all of the dirty laundry up front, right? All right, here's, here's the dirty laundry, right? Um, I, said, I said once uh, that uh, if it doesn't obey the monad laws, it isn't a monad. And I said this. And we do not know if M obeys the monad laws. So, so we don't know if it's a monad. Um, and and I, I say we don't know because in fact we do not know. Um, and it is, it is literally that, uh, that last, less than cut and dry. Um, if anyone is capable of proving one way or another, I have tried. Um, Lars Hoople has tried. Many other people smarter than us have tried. And it turns out to be a really, really, really difficult thing to prove in the positive or the negative. Um, so uh, yeah, ongoing research. But in the absence of actually knowing whether or not this thing is a monad, it's still kind of cool. So we're going to talk about why it's cool, and you can decide for yourself whether or not it's a monad and whether or not you want to actually use it for stuff. So caveat emptor. Um, also, uh, it's now 10.10, so I, I don't know when we're supposed to stop. Somebody just like pulled me off the stage. All right, um, what, is, what is M? All right, so M, M is, is spelled E-M-M. Uh, this is a pun on Oleg's F, which is spelled E-F-F, -F, and it's all like puns on, on this sort of stuff, right? Uh, you know, M, etc. Um, it's just meant to make language confusing. Um, so, so what does it do? So um, F, let's just start with here, because like F is the thing that's actually a monad, and you know, probably useful. Um, F is a monad for uh, basically abstracting over a co-product of effect handlers. And what that means is um, you have different sorts of effects that you would care about tracking. Things like IO, things like state, things like optionality, things like continuations, and this is where F starts running the problems. Um, like all, all of these stuff, these are different types of effects that you would want to control. And when you're using something like monad transformers, which we're going to digress into in a second, um, you, you kind of represent all of them as different type constructors and you stack them together. Um, F says, well, you have different handlers for these things, and you have a free coproduct of these different handlers, and then F allows you to sort of send messages to these different handlers and, and keep it all together. And F is a monad. But critically, F is a monad for composing effect handlers. Those effect handlers are not really a thing unto themselves. So if you want to, for example, use F like with your special monad thing that controls effects that are specific to like your, your like product, uh, which is not necessarily an unusual use case, um, you have to write a special effect handler. You can't use your, your Switzer monad, you have to like write a Switzer effect handler, uh, which is kind of annoying. M is different. Uh, it's different in that it might not be a monad, but it's also different in the fact that it composes monads. So when I'm working with M, I'm working with composing things like option and list and task and, you know, I, I don't know, either, right? Because uh, we, we represent all of our uh, error types of strings. Um, like, you know, all, all of this stuff, right? These are all monads. These are monads that someone else provided for me. I didn't modify them. There's nothing magical going on here. Um, and M is a way of composing these monads together into a monad. Ish. Ish. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Somebody please prove it one way or another. Um, it's, it's certainly something that looks a heck of a lot like a monad and behaves like a monad, at least in every case that I can find. Um, so uh, yeah, exhaustiveness and, and whatnot. All right, so uh, here's, here's basically what it looks like, all right? So um, what you do is you, let's say you wanted to uh, emulate something that's like an option T of task of like string or something like that, right? So you've got, you've got this function, you know, your original, original version of your function returns this, and it's going to do something like, you know, uh, you know, read from the database like a name, right? So read name, and that, let's say read name returns, a, read name is like a task of string or something. So you're going to like lift M of like, I guess, option T. Um, and then, uh, you know, you want to, you want to filter this. So you, you end up doing something crazy. Um, where you're like, you know, if name equals Daniel, then, you know, throw it away. Dot none else option T dot sum and name or something like that, yield name. All right. So this is, this is like a basic sort of monad transformer thing. And there's a couple of things that are annoying about this, but basically, basically it's not like completely unreasonable. Um, you have this lifting thing uh, that's a little bit asymmetric. So if you have a task, which is the, the effect that's sort of 
it's actually outside, but you're, you're conceptually thinking of it as inside, you're wrapped up in the option T transformer, um, then you have to like lift it up to the, the level of the transformer. Um, if you're dealing with option, then, well, tough. You don't actually have option here. You have to deal with option T. Like option T does not, like option T is not option. Like you can't take an option and sort of easily move it into option T. Um, you have to do something very different. Um, and this, if you want to extend this paradigm at all, it goes completely into the realm of madness. By the way, um, option T, option T, t uh, you know, of F, uh, you know, something is basically equivalent to like F of option of you know something. That's that's you should think of it inside out. This is one of the many things that I do not like about monotransformers. transformers. Um, okay, so so this is just like a two two step example, and it's not we're not really in crazy town yet. Like this is really it's it's kind of reasonable. Um, but uh, we, can, we can actually, M can improve on even this. So here's what you do with M. First, you define your stack. And idiomatically, for some reason, I call it E. Um, but that's just basically a thing. And you say, I want a task that's wrapped around an option. And that's my entire effect stack. And then I want to start like using this. So I'm going to have a foo that returns an M of E of string. I'm going to say, all right, read name, uh, name, uh, dot lift M. E. All right, so lift into the effect stack. Um, still not, not too dissimilar than what we've been doing. Uh, and then we're going to do basically the same thing. If name equals Daniel, then, uh, then none lift down E. Okay, this is weird. Else some name dot, dot lift down E. Okay, uh, and then yield name. So um, Thank you, Sublime, for completely randomly reinventing me. Okay, so what's what's weird about this here is that um, we're actually working with option now. We're not we're not working with like a special sort of thing that's a bit like option, which is to say option T. We're actually working with option, and um, M basically doesn't care whether or not your the effect that you're talking about is at like the top level of the stack or at the bottom level of the stack or somewhere in the middle. Um, you can just call lift M on it, and M will at compile time figure out where to put it in the stack, and, and then you sort of like move on with your life. Um, so this is a nice scalable syntax. Those of you who've been around in Scala for a long time have probably heard that a few times, but like it's a scalable syntax, right? So we can actually throw more stuff at this, which I'm gonna show you right now, all right? So the, right, like already, like I think, I think this is better. Like we're declaring ahead of time like what our effect stack is, we're being really explicit about it, we're being explicit about the ordering, this is really good documentation, but we can, we can even like go crazier with this, right? So right now we're composing two monads together, because we're composing option and task, and task of option. Let's say that we want error handling with our optionally like effectful function, right? So we might do something like um, rather, than, uh, rather than option T of task, what we're gonna do is like option T of like, I guess it's gonna be, let's see if I can figure out how to even represent this. Um, uh, actually, I'll just, here we go. Um, so it's probably gonna be something like string or task alpha, I believe. Is this right? The very fact that we're even thinking about this indicates that this is kind of a broken library, right? Um, we're going to go on the assumption that this is correct. Because what I'm trying to represent here is like something that has a, oh no, this is not right. Yeah, um, this is absolutely not right. Um, yeah, no, 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 uh, either T <laughs> of um, task of string question mark, right? Um, is everybody familiar with kind projector? That's the, this question mark thing that I'm using here. Okay, more or less. To, be, to, to make things extremely clear, I'll, I'll rewrite this using a type lambda. Um, <laughs> right, because that, that makes everything more clear. Um, yeah, all right, so this is, this is what that syntax for. When you start doing enough of this stuff, you just like, you realize that like all of your years with the type lambdas are just completely Stockholm syndrome and like your lambdas within lambdas within lambdas. Um, kind projector solves all of these problems. Dottie solves them even better. Um, but for right now, uh, yeah. All right, so this is, this is what we're doing here. So anyway, you, you already see why this is like terrible, right? Because we had to like spend a lot of time thinking about this. And I mean, I've been using monad transformers for the better part of a decade and I still can't like rattle this stuff off. That's a problem. Right? That's a problem. That's a sign that there's something really wrong with this abstraction. So let's continue on with this, right? We can no longer, we can no longer lift M option T. Now we have to like lift M either T of like string, uh, I guess, 
uh, question mark, thingy, face, string, more thing, face, and then lift them again into op option T. And like, I have no idea what this line is supposed to be. And you, you see, like, this is madness. This is madness, all right? Now, before someone raises their hand and says MTL, yes, I know about MTL, and it makes this a lot better. But we're going to pretend it doesn't exist for now and just talk about M, because that's what the talk is about. Um, <laughs> All right, so how do, we do, how do we do this with M? Well, I made the claim earlier that M is using is, 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 is a scalable syntax, right? Um, and what I mean by that is if we want to add error handling to this effect stack, well, it's literally as simple as this. And, oh shoot, it's done. I didn't actually change any of the stuff in the, uh, in the for comprehension. Because remember, all we did up here is we just like, we're just trying to make the types line up here, and then we actually gave up on line 12 because we're like, that's never going to happen. Um, now down here, all I did to add uh, either to my effect stack outside of option is I just added it to the effect stack outside of option. You know exactly how we kind of described the problem. And then this lift M now is doing the right thing. I don't have to change anything about that. This lift M is doing the right thing. And if I want to say something like, well, I want to completely filter out Daniels, but you know, if, uh, you know, if it's Chris, then we're gonna like produce some sort of error that's like go uh, go heckle someone else that lift m e else you know write name that lift m e obviously I could like I don't have to put it like on these individual terms there's no macros or anything going on here so like I referential transparency holds here you just call the function by the way I actually Hilariously, I actually have a, a version of this like on a branch where I took away the lifts entirely and that actually works which is sort of insane, but it's not syntactically referentially transparent anymore. So I don't, I don't actually think it's a good idea. But there's like, I have a, like a flat map, map M function that you can call on this that's, that's, that will infer the lifting for you and you never have to do lifting ever again. Isn't that crazy and cool? All right. Um, so you see like how easy it is to kind of work with this and work with complex effect stacks and you know throw more stuff in here and I don't know refactor your code and other stuff that we kind of like to do now and again. Um, all of that, all of that works, all of it's pretty easy and all you have to deal with, deal with is the fact that it kind of wraps off the screen. Um, so uh, that's, that's really cool. All right, so what else, what is actually going on here, right? What's, what's the catch? Well, I already told you the only catch that really matters to me, which is that it may or may not be a mode app. Um, but uh, what, what, is, what is actually happening here in the implementation, okay? Um, so in the implementation, at runtime, we have a value of the following type. Task um, of string or option or of string. I guess I should have I should have used a different error type here. Let's call this error, right? Uh, new type error equals string. Um, yeah. So uh, there we go. Um, oh yeah, error. So you get you get the idea here. This is the this is the type that we have at runtime. There's no runtime overhead, and this is actually something that M does a lot better than F. F has runtime overhead because you're doing effect handlers. You've got coproducts and things floating around that are random. You have all of the overhead of free. Um, M just has this, right? So what M, another way you can think of M is like, it's not so much a way of doing monad transformers, it's just a way of getting nice for comprehensions on top of nested type constructors. Yes? And if I do a massive amount of flat mapping at all, would it be stack safe? If you do a massive amount of flat mapping and fold, will it be stack safe? Well, I don't know, is your monad stack safe? Yes. Then yes. If the monad that you're operating through is stack safe, then yeah. So like, for example, like task, like task is stack safe, so. Okay, so it's, okay. Yeah, so it's dependent on the underlying monad. I'm not. It's not stack safe. I, no, it's not stack safe unless the underlying stuff is stack safe. I am not going to trampoline for you or anything like that because, I don't know, that's not interesting to me. Um, yeah, I would, but, I would propose you something just after we talk. Okay, I, I would be interested as to what you are going to propose. All right, so let's go back to how this is working, right? Because um, I think that's, like, I just showed you, like, how to use M. You now know how to use M. Go forth and, and prosper. But, like, it's, it, the, the, the implementation of this is actually really instructive and cool because all of this is happening at compile time. Surprise! Um, so how does, how does this actually work? Well, let's go back to first principles here. Let's say that we're just dealing with task of option, right? Um, uh, of string, right? And let's, uh, let's be you know, proper functional programmers and actually start thinking of this in terms of like actual you know, polymorphic stuff because 
getting, getting more generality in our types gets more specificity in our implementation. So things are a lot easier to reason about when we start being really crazy. Let us write a function called compose that takes two type constructors and something, some a inside of it. Um, and uh, let's uh, actually, well, by it. Let's, let's write a, um, eh, yeah, compose. Um, implicit def compose. Um, and this has actually, I'm gonna get rid of that. Uh, and let's, let's just return a monad for the, uh, the composition of these two type constructors, okay? Um, and the, the purpose behind this is to understand exactly what M is doing under the surface, right? Um, so we're just gonna like new play. All right, so there's two things that we have to do to implement monad. Uh, I guess we're in Scala Z land, so we're doing laziness. Um, we have to implement point. Point is obviously gonna be really easy, but we need to bring some constraints in. So clearly, clearly both of these are gonna to have to be monads, right? Because it doesn't make sense to try to compose together two like random functors and try to implement flat map. Clearly that's never gonna work. Um, so pointing, pointing is really straightforward, right? We just get the monad for G and we point that. Uh, and then, you know, let's just wrap around that. We get the monad for F and point that. Okay, we're done. Yay. Um, turns out that map is just as simple. So really flat map is, is where all of the complexity is, which is perhaps not surprising, right? So, um, so we've got our, our FGA and we're gonna have a function from A to FGB and then we have to return an FGB, right? Standard flat map function. Uh, how the heck are we gonna do this? Well, let's just follow our nose. Um, and I'm gonna like, yeah, I'm gonna just pretend that I have like import scalza.syntax.monad because that just makes everything easier. Um, and we're gonna like, just make this more concise. A dot point G, point F, all right. Um, all right, so we're back over here. Um, FGA, so while we have a function, we can, we can map into our like F, clearly. All right, so we've got a GA now. And we can map into our GA and we can apply F. Okay, so now, now, thing is an F or a G A, right? And uh, if we return, if we sort of like, let's just, let's just actually just return this entirely so we can see the types here, stuff. Um, the type of this should be F G F G A. So, um, okay, good, we can do functor. Um, but the, the key thing is like, how do we get this stuff like flattened out so that we actually get a monad? And it turns out that what we need to do is invert these two things that I have highlighted. We need to take F and sort of move it past G. And it turns out that there is a type class which characterizes this behavior. It's called traverse. Um, so what we need to do is we need to get a traverse, it turns out, for the G, um, which is right there. And yes. So in stuff, the, the A is a B, right? Yes. Uh, the A is a B. That is okay, correct. Okay. So Thank you for okay, correcting okay. my type solving systems. This is what happens when you try to compile with your mind rather than with like an actual machine. Um, yeah, so we need, we need a traverse for G um, because traverse is the type class that will give us the sequence operation, which is what we're gonna use here. All right, so GA map. Let's, let's get some types here, uh, inner stuff. Um, names are hard. Uh, G, F, G, A, all right? So uh, B, all right? Everybody agree on this so far? More or less? All right. Okay, we're on the same page. This is, I promise this is important. We're gonna to get to like much more exciting implicit stuff in a second. Um, okay, so uh, what we need to do, like I said, is we need to flip the, uh, flip the G and the F in this expression here. So we have to get the F to the outside, traverse it past the, uh, the G. And it turns out that, please, for the love of God, be this the sequence, sequence. I think this is the correct thing, inner stuff to please be the right. All right, um, we're gonna pretend that this is right even if it's not. Um, it's, uh, I believe this is what you're gonna get out of that. Everybody agree? Right. F is missing. F is missing? No, 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 it's okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, I think, I think this is right. I always, like, I always get something backwards when I write this function, yeah, and the compiler, like, slaps me on the face and I fix it, but we don't have a compiler today. All right, um, okay, so we've sequenced, we've sequenced to uh, FGGB. Um, now we're just going to go inner stuff to map. All right, so we're mapping into F now. And then we've got a GGB, right? Um, and we're just going to take this GGB and flatten it. 
which is to say, you know, we can lat map identity. Nothing, uh, nothing particular. Uh, we could we could collapse some of this stuff into like traverse and like you know doing more stuff here. But now now we're getting really close, right? Because we've got an FGB here, FGB, um, and we're returning this to to stuff. And I'm going to remove this type annotation because it's about to be wrong. Um, so all I'm going to do here is just change this to flat map, and because you know obviously this this FGB is going to get returned to we were mapping on F in the first place, right? So FGB. Um, now stuff is of type FGB, and we return it. So stuff. I guess stuff, yeah. Yes? Why do you really need the monad constraint on F? Wouldn't you have just uh, apply it? Uh, no, I need the monad constraint on F because I have to flat map right here. Well, but you could uh, uh, traverse directly, no? Uh, if I call, so if I call traverse over here, then I would need an applicative for F. But here, um, I do, because I, I need, at the end of the day, I'm going to need to flatten FFGB into FGB. Yeah, that's, that's monad by definition. It would be kind of cool if we could like compose an applicative and a monad and get a monad. Um, that, would be, that would be really sweet, but I don't think you can actually do that. Well, you can get an applicative. You can get an applicative, though. But that applicative would not be consistent with the monad, which is something that we're going to talk about here. It's like, this is, this is like heckle sub point two is like, there's, there's a way of deriving an applicative really easily in this way. Because like, like I talked about, like map is trivial, right? Point was trivial, map is trivial. It turns out that apply two is also trivial in this. But if you derive apply two in this way, it's inconsistent with the apply two you derive through flat. Yeah, but I think this can be quite a problem with concurrence. Uh, monad, no. I mean, uh, well, if your concurrent monad is doing like magically concurrent apply to, then your concurrent monad has bigger yes, problems. Like, uh, uh, Haxel. like what? Haxel, you know the Haskell project oh. from uh, Simon Marble. Yeah, they shouldn't be doing that. Well, they, they, they new type their. Uh, yeah, if they, if they new type it into an applicative, then I'm fine with it. But yeah, they shouldn't. They shouldn't be like making it inconsistent. So what if we have a Clisley of task? Clisley of task. Um, See me after class, Mr. Vincent. Um, no, that's that's a problem, uh, and I will I will explain how you solve that problem in a bit. But we are, yeah, I, I hope to get to that. But yeah, Cleisley and state and generically anything that is in the Cleisley category is a problem for this technique um, because you can't like directly derive it from a first order monad. Um, where I'm defining order along a very strange axis here. Um, so that's, that's kind of an interesting problem. But we're going to stick with first order stuff for now, because that, that, that kind of at least doesn't escape the weird sandbox. All right, so does everybody agree? Does everybody agree that this function takes two monads, puts them together, and gets a monad out the end? More or less? All right, well, yes, the, the right answer is shrug emoticon, because we don't actually know. Like, clearly the types line up. Like, this will compile, and it'll run, and most of the time it will sort of behave the way you would think. But, uh, in fact, all of the time that I can think of, it'll behave the way you think. But, um, we don't act, we, like, it turns out that just proving that the monad laws hold for this composition, FGA, or, or FG question mark, is, is really, really, really hard. So if you can solve this problem for me, that would be great. Um, all right, so we've done it now for, we've written a function for composing two type constructors together. I'm making the claim that M has the machinery to be able to do this for an arbitrary number of type constructors, you know, F, G, H, whatever's after H in the alphabet, like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It can do that an arbitrary number of times um, at compile time. And the way in which this works is pretty cool. So we're going to dive into the M code base. Ready? Binder. Uh, that is binder. Oh, cool. Like, if, apparently, if you mash on the keyboard, Sublime will take you to the right place. Um, all right. Well, let's actually just look at M first. Uh, yeah, M. All right. So M is here. Uh, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. All right, uh, I guess we have to. I guess we have to look at effects first. But um, so this is where we're. This. Is, oh yeah, cyclic checking. Um, this is where we're defining the pipe bar thing. So pipe bar, as you may have noticed, is basically an H list. It's a phantom H list. There's no values involved, and it's an H list of type constructors, which is different than shapeless's H list or really the H list that anyone sane would write. Um, and it's it's encoded in a relatively standard way. Ignore the pivot thing, like this this like hyphen pipe bar thing. This solves Vincent's Cleisley problem. Please ignore it. Um, the important point here, the important bit here is pipe and base. And then there's a point type, a type level function on um, effects, which is the H list type. 
um, that takes an A. And what this will do, like what point will do, is if you say like F pipe G pipe H, point will put all of these together and it will say F of G of H of A. That's what point will do for it. So it's just a context, indepe or context independent type level function. Um, the reason it's complicated is because when we have a Claisley or something like that, we have to do this weird thing where we like compose the front end to like f of g, and then oh shoot, we have a Claisley, so we have to take that and like flip it in the middle, and then okay, we've got some more stuff on the other end that we can compose. Yeah, turns out that you can do this like without using implicits, but you run into like cyclic type checking bugs, which is really fun. Um, I can uh, I can go into more detail about how you get around that, but it's it's really kind of weird what you have to do. Um, the important point is like composition. I am going to finish up in five minutes because we started ten minutes late. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna kind of motor through this as fast as I can. Um, all right, so we've got this here. So in, a, in the case of our example, this is going to be like a task of either of option of a, right? Um, that's literally the type that will that Scala will compute here. So now we've got these functions on M, and here's flat map. So it takes an A to M of C, you know, B, right? We're just wrapping around this thing. Um, and then we take a binder, right? A binder type class. Well, you should actually think of this as a binder implicit proof. So there's a proof, we have to generate a proof at compile time that we are allowed to flat map over this effect stack. An interesting consequence of this that you might realize is that if we go back to our entitled buffer, if we were to build an effect stack that was something like, you know, type E equals like, you know, validation, you know, uh, I don't know, validation error of, uh, yeah, and then task of like base, this is clearly not a monad in any sense of the word. Um, and um, because, as, as I've sort of been implying, right, we need to generate a proof that we can flat map over it, we will not be able to generate a proof that we can flat map over this. But we can generate a proof that we can map over it, and M will be perfectly happy to prove that for us. Um, and in generating that proof, we will um, be, why is like Scaladoc so annoying? All right, um, in generating that proof, we will be able to do things. All right, so binder, binder, what does this implicit proof look like? Okay, it looks like this. Um, by the way, one of the, exam one of the um, benefits of M that I didn't talk about is you get really nice error messages because I'm doing this all with implicit machinery. So I can do things like I couldn't prove that like this effect stack that you gave me is a valid monadic stack. Uh, maybe one of the effects in there isn't actually a monad or maybe the outer or maybe something inside is missing a traverse. I don't know what it is, but I can give you this nice error message rather than like vomiting on your screen C++ well, template style. It's nice because it's really precise, right? Uh, well, it's because I don't have type two strings. I think, I think with implicit macros, I could probably improve on this, but I wanted to keep macros out of this for the time being. Um, yeah, if I could control the two string on this stuff, like my life would be so much better. All right, so the binder implicit proof, it has a bind that takes something that's of type, the type constructor, remember C point A, I told you that was the type constructor, so task of either of option. Um, and then uh, A to CCB, so in other words, if, we, if we're just like working with two type constructors here, then this is literally the compose function that we wrote earlier, like the monad compose thing. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna define it inductively. We're gonna say that in a base case, where you have a literally empty effect stack, um, well, that's, that's the same as like binding over the identity monad, so it's really trivial, right? You just return, you just apply the function, like there's nothing to do there. Um, the interesting thing is when you're doing the inductive case. Uh, don't look at pivot. Um, so the inductive case, if you squint through the Leibnizes, all right? So NN, okay, NN is a Leibniz, um, and I, I have to do this because there's like some more proving that I have to do to make the compiler happy with the types. Um, but basically speaking, you can just like pretend that this stuff doesn't exist. Um, there, all right, it's gone. Um, so uh, we're gonna get the flat mapper from the, for B, all right, so where, where does B come from? It looks like B is, oh, it's over here. So we find in scope a type class that has flat map um, uh, for the F type constructor, just like we did before. And we find applicative for F because I don't know redundancy. Um, and then we find a, a traverser, which is just like binder, it's just going to find a traverse for the entire stack for C, and a binder for C. 
So this is basically the analog of the composed function we wrote before. We needed a monad for one side and a monad and a traverse for the other side. We're going to find both of them and then we're going to use those. We're going to flat map into FCA. We're going to traverse instead of sequence because I wanted to write it more concisely. We're going to have insane, insane variable names. We're going to map back into it, bind it with identity just like we did before and the whole thing is inside a flat map so we return it. And this is the inductive case. And it turns out that because we're doing this implicitly and we're doing it with this like more binder and like more traverser thing, like traverser is just like, you know, given an applicative and a traverse for an entire stack, it'll just like build a traverse for the whole stack. Um, given, uh, given all of that stuff and some more Leibniz things that you should ignore, um, we can build a, uh, an, an implicit proof and the implementation at the value level for the fact that we can flat map over this effect stack. Isn't that cool? Yeah. All right, so I have probably, okay, I've got like four seconds left. All right, so uh, very quickly, caveat here, like I said before, if you derive an applicative from this flat map, um, and then you derive another more different applicative from just like composing map together, well, more importantly, composing apply to together, which you could do, right? Like that would make sense, and we could do that for our like validation of task effect stack. That applicative and that monad that you derive through two different things will be inconsistent. Because if you derive an applicative from the flat map that you derived over here, you're going to get an applicative that behaves in a completely different way from the applicative that you compose together over here. This is kind of a warning bell, right? It's not necessarily a problem because applicative doesn't really have, like applicative is very laissez-faire about like a lot of its laws. It's really kind of a strange type class. Um, and traverse is like even worse. So um, it's really not clear if there's any real problem here, but I don't know, maybe. Um, anyway, I'm going to have to stop because we're out of time and we're already late. Does anybody have any very quick questions? Okay, thank you very much.